In the summer of 1968, I was hired by the Federal Electric Company to work as a radician in the Canadian Arctic. After a very thorough medical and some repairs to my teeth, I found myself on the way to the Dewline Training Facility in a farmer's field 100 miles south of Chicago in Streeter, Illinois. Following 10 weeks of training in Streeter, we made our way to Winnipeg for transport north. We boarded an old DC-4, a far cry from the modern jet aircraft we were used to flying on. The interior of the aircraft had five or six seats located at the back of the cabin. Piles of baggage and provisions occupied the rest of the cabin space. After 13 hours of listening to the drone of the engines and enduring the teeth rattling vibrations, we arrived in Cape Dyer. We loaded our gear onto a 4x4 bus and followed a twisting gravel road lined with 10-foot bamboo poles, apparently to mark the location of the road when the snows came. I soon learned that shift work was the norm for reditions on the dew line. Nine hours per day and six days per week. The first four hours were spent on the radar console. Repairs and routine maintenance on the equipment occupied your time for the rest of the shift. Console operations included tracking and communicating with all aircraft within our coverage area and monitoring local traffic at our own airport. Occasionally some Russian bombers would fly south between Greenland and the Canadian mainland. They were not considered a threat. Things were mostly routine, but sometimes they got very exciting. On one occasion, three T-33 jet trainers were en route to Sonderstrom Air Base in Greenland. They started to make their approach and then lost contact with the air base. The next thing I knew, they were calling me, asking for assistance. For the next half hour, I unsuccessfully tried to make contact with Sonderstrom via the landline. Eventually, the jets ran out of fuel and the pilots had to bail out. We took a fix on the last radar contact we had with them. Communications with Sonderstrom was finally restored and this information was passed on. They were all picked up within two hours. Only minor injuries were reported. We later found out that there had been a major power failure and the air base and radar and communications had been knocked out. An important source of off-hours entertainment was the movies. Each week, three of the current crop of Hollywood movies were put into circulation at the far western end of the dew line. When everybody at that station had viewed them, they were passed on to the next station, and so on, until they reached us. It was one of the Radition's jobs to show the movies, splice the film if it broke, and keep the projector in good repair. The movies usually consisted of three reels. You had to be careful and not get the reels mixed up. Sometimes it did happen. You then had to endure the jeers of the audience as to your competence as a projectionist. I once missed a whole reel. I jumped from reel one to reel three. We had missed a half hour or more of the movie, and yet nobody had noticed. Nine months came and went quickly. Upon my return from my first leave, I was transferred to another site. Brevoort Island, Res X-1 lay 231 miles south of Cape Dyer and had one of the most spectacular airstrips on the dew line. The 2,500 foot runway lies on top of a 600 foot cliff with a 400 foot hill on the other end. Weather was an ongoing problem at Res X. It was not uncommon to have 60 to 70 mile an hour winds, zero visibility and blowing snow. These conditions sometimes lasted for 20 to 30 days, preventing the aircraft from resupplying us. The record was 38 days. The length of the days was a phenomenon that took some getting used to. During the summer months, the days were 24 hours long. The sun would only set for 15 minutes at 3 in the morning. It never got dark. Compare that to the winter months when it was only light for about an hour around 11 a.m. On a clear day you could see 10 to 15 miles out over the surrounding waters. Hundreds of icebergs could be seen. 
I had no idea of their size until one day a Coast Guard icebreaker sailed by. Observed through binoculars, it was only a tiny black speck against the backdrop of icebergs. I spent four years on the dew line and enjoyed the experience. It was interesting and challenging work. Life goes on. Circumstances change. One day while out on leave in Vancouver, I decided not to return. I really don't know why. I guess I just felt it was time to move on. Shortly after that, I met and married my wife Nancy and started on a new journey in my life. But that's another story.